Hello everyone, I'm Greg Otta with FedScoop TV and we're here at the Adobe Digital Government Assembly and I'm talking with General Michael Hayden, now a principal at the Chertoff Group but former NSA and CIA director. Right. General, thanks for joining us oh, today. Ha happy to be here, Greg, thank you. So, just had a book come out, congratulations on the book. <laughs> thank you. Let's talk first about- First one I've written, I've read a couple but this is the first one I've written. <laughs> All right. So in the book, you describe the effort at the start of the last decade to transform IT at the NSA. Yeah. Uh, what can you tell and what advice do you have for current government agencies yeah. that are going through the transition of getting out of legacy tech and modernizing their yeah. systems? Uh, well, number one, we had some wins and we had some losses. Okay. The, the win, I think, was what we call the groundbreaker program, which, which was fundamentally, we outsourced our IT. Okay. All right? We, we, we just felt, we couldn't recapitalize it, which, which was what it really needed. Okay. All right? We couldn't recapitalize it on the government bureaucratic budgetary schedules. But if you turn it over to the private sector, they have the ability to invest heavily at the beginning, refresh everything, and then amortize the cost over the lifespan of the equipment. So, so we went to the private sector to do that. It was very dramatic. I'm actually surprised that more agencies haven't done it because actually it worked quite well. Now we figuratively speaking, kind of had a gun at our head when we did it. Okay. Because our IT went belly up. I mean, we were dead in the water for about three and a half days in, okay. in January of 2000. And so I, I decided, and I write about this in the book, Greg, I said, I was trying, first of all, to do no harm. Right. But after we were out of business for half a week, I decided no course of action I could set out on would be more dangerous than standing still. And so we outsourced our IT. Less successful is we went to the private sector for something called Groundbreaker, okay. which fundamentally was outsourcing our mission stuff. And, and there, there we were asking industry to do things even industry hadn't done before. Whereas with the IT system, industry's got history. When we went and asked industry to do things that even industry hadn't done before, the results were far less satisfying. So we had, we had, a, we had a mixed bag. But, but if you're asking me what's, what should people in government now think of, think about the private sector as a really important partner. Interesting, okay. So you mentioned the unintended consequences of the way the U.S. military set itself up to fight in the cyber domain. What did you mean by that when you say yeah, that? No, it's, it, look, all right, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a GI, all right? Okay. When, when somebody comes to me, and this actually really happened, and there, there's a chapter in there where I, I kind of take my, my life cycle over the whole cyber thing, and it begins in Texas in the 90s. I'm, I'm coming out of the Balkans, all right? I'm dealing with a war that's almost medieval in, in <laughs> Bosnia and right. Croatia. Okay. And then I get parachuted into San Antonio. And my new staff, I don't think they ever quite said these words to me, but the summation of my orientation was, General, sit down, take out a clean sheet of paper and a number two pencil and write this down. Land, sea, air, space, cyber. And once you get that, and once you get an American I, uh, GI saying, oh, it's a domain, you can't, well, why didn't you say so? Right. Okay. Why is all this complex language? It's a domain. And so we then prepared ourselves to operate in that domain. I mean, frankly, to guarantee its use for us when we wanted to and deny its use to other people when we chose to. That's what we do in all the other domains. And we did that with the best of intentions. In fact, it, it was a good thing. But frankly, we were probably a little insensitive to people outside of our fence line who, who didn't view this new cyber domain as a potential zone of combat, which it was, but viewed it as kind of a digital Eden, a, a global commons. And we probably should have been more open, in, not, in, not in terms of our being public, we were, but more open in dialogue with those who had this different view uh, of the cyber domain. And so now, now we have the United States being accused, I think somewhat unfairly, okay. of being accused of leading the militarization of the cyber domain. So, changing focus now, l let's talk about what's been in the headlines in the past few days, <laughs> specifically about you know, going you're, dark. You have to be more specific. There are a lot of headlines in the <laughs> right, last Right, okay. Days. So, so the going dark yeah. issue. Um, Let's talk about how worried intelligence agencies and law enforcement is. Isn't the explosive growth of things like the Internet of Things, connected cars, um, isn't that really a chance for an expansion of signals intelligence? <laughs> so is, is the, the worry really 
Re I, not relevant, but is it grounded in, in fact, or is this just being drummed so, up? So, so here's how I think about it. And, and what, the texture of this book okay. is that th everything in it and what we're going to talk about now, Greg, is played out on a field of gray. There's no black and white. Right. And we're not talking about the forces of light and the forces of darkness. It, it, we're, we're trying to balance things, all of which are virtues, you know, liberty, security, privacy, safety, and so on. So now we've got another debate because, because of encryption. Um, here's where I come down on it, all right? I, I actually think, given all the dangers, there's a totality of dangers that Americans are in today, that the best security option, I'm not, I'm not even taking up the banner for privacy. I could do that as a citizen. But as the former NSA guy, looking at this just through a security lens, I actually think the best way to make America most secure is with unbreakable end-to-end -end encryption with no back doors. Now, I get it. That makes the job of law enforcement more difficult in some specific circumstances, even makes intelligence a bit more difficult, although I do think the heaviest hand falls on law enforcement because they obviously have more limits on, on alternatives that, that intelligence can go after. And so uh, that, that's my bottom line. On security grounds alone, I think unbreakable end-to-end -end encryption is best. Now, I know what the Bureau has asked for pre uh, San Bernardino. Right. It, it was kind of a, a universal enabling of a back door. And, and, and look, they were very careful about it, dual key, under lock and key, court order, and so on. I, I get it, all right? But, but my professional judgment is, if somebody would have come to me when I was Dernza and director of NSA and, and said, there's a back door in that system, my first reaction would have been, thank you, Lord, <laughs> okay? Because it's not a guarantee I was going to get in, but it gave me an opportunity that would not otherwise have been available. And, and I mean, something just occurred to me, I really did, on, on the train coming down okay. here from New York. For the last three years, Jim Clapper, when he's done his worldwide threat briefing, has said the greatest danger to the United States is comprised of cyber threats. Right. All right? And here we are with this, if, if you go with the macro FBI request, all right? It's prioritizing fighting terrorism over protecting us against cyber threats. That's inconsistent right. with what the Director of National Intelligence said was the big worry. Now, go forward, fast forward from the, from the macro FBI request to the micro one. San Bernardino, I want to get into that phone. I actually see differences between that and what I just described. Okay. All right? And, and I, I know that Tim Cook and others and Apple are, are arguing passionately that this necessarily leads to that. I am not yet convinced of that. And if that's true, Tim Cook and Apple, the burden of proof is on them. So on this specific case, I'm shading in the direction of the Bureau, where at the macro level, this is, I think, a pretty clear choice. Now look, the Bureau is not helped, all right? The Bureau is not helped by claiming this to be a one-off. And you've got the U.S. Attorney in Manhattan saying, and by the way, when you're done with that thing in California, I got 175 more right. of these in the back room. Right. All right. That undercuts the, the one-off nature of the FBI's argument. Anyway, that, that, that's where I come to, to, to sit on this. How do you see this ending? Do you see this ending in a legislative I, way? Because I know that uh, Senator Warner and yeah. Rhett McCall are going to have an yeah. encryption commission come to light very soon. So I don't Are, are yeah. you for legislation? I am. I, I am. All right. right. Right now, the Bureau is asking the court to impose something on Apple based on a statute written in 1789. All right? Well, let's take a look. <laughs> and, 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 you know, again, the, the theme of the book is, th you know, these are hard choices. Right. You know, free peoples have to decide where it is they want to be. So let's just have that open debate. Now, I may not be happy with the legislation that comes out. Tim Cook may not be happy. Jim Comey may not be happy. I don't know where it comes out. All right? But, but let's have at it as, as an adult nation looking at something that, frankly, we haven't experienced much before. Great. General, the book, Playing to the Edge, American Intelligence in the Age of Terror. Really appreciate you dropping by today. Thank you very much. Thanks.